everybody. My name is Avi Tenenbaum, and you can learn more about me at my website, psychotraumaunit.com. I'd like to thank Chaim Bechesed for this initiative and for all the incredible things that they do for the community all year round. They are one of the most important, indispensable organizations for Engels here in Israel. They're your friend and your family for everything that you need. It's a fantastic group of people that I know personally who work tirelessly and professionally to make sure that everybody's okay here in Israel. We'd like to thank you for all that you do. The first thing that I'd like to ask you to do is to go to my website, psychotraumaunit.com, and look at the free downloads page. You're going to find there 15 infographics in Hebrew and in English, all about how to get through situations exactly like this as a family, with ourselves, in a resilient way, in an effective way. And I encourage you to go to the website, download all the 15 infographics, share them in social media, read them. What's going to happen is we're going to address now three or four of the most commonly asked questions that parents right now are asking. And we want you to know that once this talk is done, instead of feeling like the talk was great, but what do I walk away with? You'll be able to download the infographics, review them, find which ones you feel are relevant to you, the ones that you connect with most, share them with whoever you need in your family, and try to use those ideas to get through the situation as resilient and as effectively as possible. So again, go to the website, psychotraumaunit.com, go to the free downloads page in English, also in Hebrew, 15 infographics that are very easy to read with different related topics, different breathing techniques and how to speak to our children during crisis, like a war, so on and so forth, et cetera. Check it out, please. One of the things that I'd like to start this talk by saying is that a Kaddish Baruch Hu gave us a parental instinct to love our children and therefore be caregivers for them, be careful, worried about them, and we can embrace that instinct and appreciate it. I have children here in Eretz Yisrael, although I live in Eretz Yisrael and I'm used to being here, but I can understand what it feels like in my way during a war that our children are here and things are happening in the South. What does it mean for our child? And I'd like you to know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave you that instinct. It's a beautiful thing, and it's working inside of you. Let's recognize it in that beautiful, positive light. Let's embrace that. Let's accept that. Once we accept that, we have that urge to be careful with our children, have our finger on the pulse, see what's going on, and that that's something wonderful that HaKadosh Baruch Hu put inside of our hearts in order to keep our loved ones safe, once we recognize that, we can continue in this talk and we can see practically what to do. So please recognize that it's a wonderful adaptive thing and it's there to help humankind to flourish and to become healthy, happy people, to perpetuate and to be safe. You have that cloth inside of you and it's beating inside of you right now. We want to use our parental instinct effectively. We don't want to smother our children. We don't want to overwhelm our children with panic. But we do want to take care of our children. We do want to make sure that they're okay. And that's a beautiful thing. We don't have to fix them. I ran national programs in Israel in the past concerning uh, topics like this, where we take care of the mental health and well-being of thousands upon thousands of people here in Israel during the war. I have experience in this. I'm connected to the police and Hatzalah. In the past, I also worked with the Army. I worked with the Misrata with the Ministry of Health. And whether it's intelligence sources that police are using or the military is using, whether it's open intelligence, all I know is that I'm seeing the Kohot HaBitachon, the security forces here in Israel, working so hard to protect every single person here. They're working around the clock. I went shopping today. The store is empty, but it's not empty for bad reasons. It's empty because every single fighter, every single father or mother or person that was trained in the IDF that knows how to use a rifle, use a tank, use a plane, use a helicopter, collect information about the enemy. They're busy right now. They're busy right now working hard and creating safety, creating security. I studied about how to analyze risks in university, and I have some experience with this in the field as well, with the police work that I do and other work that I do as a first responder, as a person that deals with crisis and disaster management. The way safety works is that we create safety. 
the way we create safety on one foot is we look and see what's going on. We try to understand it. We try to analyze the level of risk. We try to make predictions. We try to take steps to make sure that these things don't evolve into something worse, to stop small problems before they become big, to destroy things in the root before they fester, to create preventative measures and direct interventions. We also have people that are looking at things that already happened and taking lessons to understand if this happened yesterday, what might happen today, what might happen tomorrow. And I can rest assure you, again, I'm not an official spokesman, not for the police, not for the Home Front Command, not for the Army, but I can rest assure you all the people that I know are working 150% to create that safety. And it's 2023, so we have a lot of coordination. We're using different social media apps and all sorts of different methods of being in touch, sharing very important information. And we're doing all of that to create that wall of safety so that when you go to sleep in New Jersey or Toronto or Australia, wherever you are, and you say, how can I go to sleep? I don't know what's with my child. I'm worried. You can remember that there are thousands upon thousands, more accurately, hundreds of thousands of security forces right now creating that wall of safety and worrying for you about your child. You want to make sure that not a single person gets hurt and they're doing an excellent job. So please know that. Of course, have bitachon. I'm not giving a talk right now about spiritual matters. I hope that you consult with your rub about that and you read the Sfarim and the different resources that you connect with. I speak about this in the infographics that I created. That's just not the topic of this talk. But on the level of hishtadlus, on the level of what's actually happening, there is a war in the South. There are terrorists that came into Israel. Certainly, certainly as a result of the people that came in in the South into Israel that emboldened other people already in Israel to do different things. But we're working really hard for you so that you can sleep with 10 or 15% more calm when you go to sleep. I'm not asking for 100%, but I think 15% is a reasonable amount of calm to say, I'm not doing this all by myself. There's the police, there's the IDF, there's the yeshivas. As yeshivas and seminaries finish, Yom Tov Shani and the Igud and all the different people involved get together, they're going to coordinate excellently, professionally, exactly what guidelines to make to be even more on top of the situation, have their finger on the pulse and to work together. So that's the situation that your child right now is in and Baruch Hashem. So there's a lot of people worrying about them for you on your behalf. It's important to add that when you're not here in Israel or if you're here in Israel, but you're not used to living in Israel or you're not familiar with the different geographical areas in Israel, then it's extremely hard to understand what you're seeing on the news. We know that the news is full of bloodlust and they want clicks. They want to make money on drama. And so if you're getting your information from the news, so it seems absolutely shocking and horrifying. And I'm not saying that it isn't, but if your child is sitting in Jerusalem or in Tzvat and they're studying and you're trying to use the news to assess what's going on with your child, it's a very poor um measurement to assess that with. And like I said before, rest assured, things are better here than in the South, much better. And a lot of steps are being taken to contain what's going on. What happened was, in a nutshell, this is my understanding, Israel was hit with a surprise attack. And now Israel is fighting back and working to contain it. Imagine there's a fire, there's a big forest fire, and all the firefighters were called and they're trying to put the fire out. That's what's going on. So in the beginning, it was catastrophic because it hit us without us realizing. And now we're responding to it and we're learning from it. We're bringing all the different people together, all the resources to bear down on what's happening and to make it organized and effective. Now that we gave that introduction to what's going on, one of the most commonly asked questions right now by parents, especially parents abroad, is how can I support my child from afar but without causing panic. And I think the simple answer to that is we need to be attuned to our children's feelings. Every single person's child is going to react differently to what's going on. There's a lot of reasons for why all of our children will react differently. I discussed this in some of my social media that's going to be coming out soon in the next month or so on my YouTube channel. But basically, we're all different people. We have different personalities, different experiences, 
we have previous traumas sometimes, we have different struggles, different ways of understanding how the world works. We have different beliefs. And we use all of those experiences, thoughts, beliefs to interpret what's going on around us and reach conclusions about what that means. And so everybody's different. And even in my own family, I have five children, Baruch Hashem, Kanai Nohara. And some of my children are super calm and other ones are not super calm. So everybody's different and that's okay. The fact that our child or us is more scared, less scared, why aren't we scared? How come we're so scared? We can't compare one person to another. It's not a fair comparison. And everybody's different. In a situation like this, what we're looking to do is to help everybody be as functional as possible during this difficult and challenging time. It's not a wedding. It's not Hanukkah. There's no Masiba with Natkas. It's not a happy time. So we're not necessarily trying to dance and pretend nothing is going on. But what we want to do is we want to be resilient. And that means we were given a nisayon, a test, a situation, and we're trying to help ourselves, our families, our children get through this as effectively as possible. That's our goal. If we're dysfunctional because we're busy screaming and crying all day, two weeks in a row, we can't learn, we can't sleep, we're not eating, that's a problem. If we're sleeping constantly and we're not participating in what's going on, or we're using drugs or drinking constantly in order to cope, that's a problem. The fact that our children are scared or worried, well, that makes sense because they're in a situation that's scary and worrisome, right? So again, we're not trying to do the impossible and create magic and magically make our children happy during a war. It is unnerving, especially because our children probably don't speak Hebrew. They don't know what's going on. And if they know what's going on, they're getting different news from WhatsApp groups, and there's no context, there's no explanation, they don't know what's happening, they don't know how the army works, they've never been to the South before, they don't know what any of the things mean, and so they're up to their imagination and the imagination of their friends to interpret everything that's happening. And again, what I recommend is that we encourage our children to rely on the organizations that are responsible for taking care of them here in Israel, the seminaries and the yeshivas and the parents to create a responsible narrative to be realistic on the one hand about what's going on, but without creating panic, without extra information that's dramatic and, you know, unnecessary and not necessarily true and just there to, you know, get more clicks. We don't want to be victims of believing those things. I could just tell you a story. I think it was two hours ago. Somebody called me up and said, Avi, there are People coming towards the neighborhood right now, they're going to kill us all. I heard this from somebody who heard it from someone who heard it from someone. Okay, so I reported it to the police, but I did some checking out, and it's what you call in Hebrew, sipure safta. It's just a rumor. It's something that somebody kind of embellished and exaggerated. They wanted attention, and they repeated something secondhand, thirdhand, forehand, and, and that's something common that happens in these types of scenarios. So just because we see something, it doesn't mean it's true. Let's be responsible responsible let's be responsible but let's be responsible about what we see what it means and relate that to our children in order to support our children we want to check in with them as much as they need and that's why i used the word previously attunement and attunement means to be aware of what my child needs understanding that he may not need anything or something or a lot of something and everybody's different OK, we can validate their fears if they're afraid and we can give them a tip on how to cope. What tip do we give them? Well, the first tip we can always give them is what tip Shlaimi or Sarah do you think would help you right now to cope? How much is your fear from zero to 10, 10 being the most fear and zero being the least? What's something that you can do if you're a 10 to bring it down to an eight, bring it down to a six, bring it down to a seven? OK, that's the type of thing that we're looking to do. We're trying to invite our children to come up with solutions that they can think of on their own. Maybe it's reading to him. Maybe it's saying a certain pasach of bitachon. Maybe it's just sitting and learning. Maybe it's helping out the war effort through the seminary. Maybe there's some sort of chesed initiative that they'll have in the schools of the soldiers. Whatever it is, it's something practical. We want to move people from helplessness to helpfulness. Instead of learned helplessness, instead of being sitting ducks, 
and feeling that there's nothing we can do to participate in this situation. We want people to feel that they have mesugalut, they have what to add, to participate, to do. Maybe it's inspiration, okay? There's always something that everybody can do, something spiritual, something practical. Maybe it's raising money from their friends in yeshiva for some sort of organization that's donating food or equipment or something like this. Whatever it is, we want people to feel that they're helpful. Maybe it's sitting and learning Torah many, many hours. Every person with their yeshiva, their seminary, each in their own misgeret and their own framework. I think it's okay to set up with our child some sort of arrangement or expectation if you and them feel this is important or helpful, that you'll check in with them once a day or once a week. Again, and that's going to depend on what you feel your child needs. And when I say check in, it doesn't have to be anything deep. It doesn't have to be you're asking a question and you're looking for deep insight. It doesn't have to be that you're looking to see that they're happy. What it just means is, hey, how is today for you? How is your learning today? How is your studies in seminary? That's all it has to mean. Okay, it could be every other day. It could be at the same time every day. It's just a ritual. And that ritual shows that we're present as your parents. We didn't forget about you. We're in the background. And maybe you don't even need us. Maybe you think you're so cool and you're a teen and you can handle this on your own. That's fine. But we're just in the background. And if you need us, we're right here. Okay? So we're creating opportunities to be present. We're showing our kids we're around. But we're not being intrusive. But if they invite us to help them out and they share something, of course, we can get more involved and we can see how to help them. We can connect them to a mental health professional if that's what they need. We can invite them to come up with some sort of coping mechanism that they can figure out on their own. We can figure out together with the things that they're telling us about their yeshiva and their seminary within that framework of study and the rules of the school, what they can do during their curfew or whatever the scenario is to feel good and feel helpful and develop resilience. I think that our presence and simple check-ins are an incredible tool. And it's okay, by the way, if we're afraid or if our child is afraid. I heard from I heard from one of Israel's biggest experts in psychological trauma for war today that when they first heard about the invasion and what's going on, they threw up over and over and over and over. And they called Israel's top expert, Moshe Farhi, who he helped that person who is one of the biggest experts to calm down and to catch themselves and to find their breathing and slow it down and to think cognitively and to move over from their emotions and the stormy feelings that they had and the panic that they had over to being more cerebral, more practical, more pragmatic. And those are the things I talk about in the war tips, the downloads that I spoke about. But even the biggest expert in Israel and the second biggest expert they were afraid and they reached out for help. So if you're afraid and you're not able to contain it and you're broadcasting it to your child, it's not going to sound very good. So you can use these tips on yourself. You can have a buddy system with a friend, another mother, another father, with your Rav, whatever it is, whoever is your mentor, your friend, to help you become more stoic, more professional, and more of a anchoring resource for your child at this time. And certainly, we can also broadcast to our children that if they need help or if they have a question, if they're worried about something, if they need to share something that they're really ashamed about, they don't want anyone to know, and they're afraid if they tell you they're not going to be cool anymore, you're going to quickly pull them home, but they don't want to go home. Just let's make sure that we're available and we create the type of relationship and environment that our children feel comfortable approaching us with those issues, opening up to us, and then we'll see what to do with them because maybe they have something that they're really, really worried about. Maybe they're embarrassed about it. Maybe they're having nightmares. Maybe they wet their bed. Maybe they're afraid to leave the yeshiva or seminary. And these are all common things that happen to people who are really, really worried. Maybe they're starting to relapse in an addiction that they have. Maybe they don't wanna get out of bed for several days in a row. Whatever it is, we wanna be able to be not too intrusive, not too panicky, just in the background enough and inviting enough, understanding enough and supportive enough that they'll be able to share that with us if they want to, if they need to, and we'll be able to use inquiry to connect them to, hey, 
Is there somebody in your yeshiva that helps guys to get some help? Can you speak to your mashkiach? Is there an in-house therapist? Do you want me to find somebody for you? This type of thing. And we'll make sure that our children have everything that they need. Imagine that your children are here afar in Israel and you are all the way in United States or Canada, South Africa, Australia, wherever you are, because that's true. And you are the home front command, the OREF, as they say in Hebrew, for the children here. You're their backup. And so if they're feeling some stress, you're the one that's helping tether them and broadcasting covertly and overtly, hey, we're right behind you, whether it's we're davening that you're okay and we know that you're going to be okay, whether it's we're in touch with your yeshiva and they're doing a great job of making sure that everything is going to be fine or just checking in like we spoke about. However you feel is the right way to support your child and make sure that they have everything that they need, their concerns are addressed, okay? They know that they have you to turn to and to cling to. You're their caregiver. You're the first person that they ever met. You're the ones that changed their diapers. You're the ones that understand them so well and know how they tick and what they need and what triggers them. And you're always going to be their parents and you have an invaluable role. On the other hand, adolescents are very independent. They're trying to prove their independence and they think it's really, really cool to be independent and it's hard for them to admit if they need help and they may not even need any help. It's really okay if they don't need any help as well. So we want to take all of those things into account wisely and use our judgment. I hope this video was helpful to you. Please share it with other parents if you found it to be beneficial. We should only hear good news. Am Yisrael Chai, Netzach Yisrael Lo Yishaker, Ashrei Yish Gachacha, Hashem is with us and Be'ezer Hashem Yisbarach. No more Jews should be hurt and will win. Everyone should be safe, and we should only hear good things. And be zeichet to Mashiach Tzidkenu b'mihir b'meinu. Amen.